working on a book entitled Architecting Interactivity. Mm -hmm. um, it, the book delves into the historical relationship between design, cybernetics, artificial intelligence, and architecture. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the, the most impactful results of those relationships and how they're directly affecting designers and design today? Sure. So in the book, I take a look at four different kind of big case studies. I look at the work of Christopher Alexander. So if you've ever heard of a pattern language, he's mm -hmm. the person behind that. Um, Cedric Price, who's a British architect that architects know about and um, designers do not, but I think he is a secret patron saint of interaction designers. Um, Nicholas Negroponte, who mm -hmm. founded the MIT Media Lab, I write about the predecessor to it, the Architecture Machine Group at, uh, at MIT, and then Richard Sol Werman. And I use those case studies to look at how um, these various architects, and they are actually all architects, um, picked up various notions of computation or worked with cybernetics or ideas from AI starting in the 1960s and how those kind of morph and carry forward into things we pick up today in interaction design. Um, when we talk about problem solving and situating design as a problem to be solved, um, that's one of the themes that comes through visualization um, and then you know that's another thing that comes through how you visualize a problem in order for it to be solved how we interact with responsive environments that's mm -hmm. something that comes out of Cedric Price's work right and um, and then how we understand um, how we think through artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and that's something that um, the architecture machine group and Nicholas Negroponte were working on in the 60s and 70s through a set of projects and I think these shape how we see interactivity happening around us today um, in some in some new and novel ways right now architects aren't a fan of the term architecting they're not and so <laughs> why did you choose that term well it's a word that you know I think system designers and technologists use the word architect as a verb um, to talk about how they design a system. When a really complex system needs to be designed, they architect it. Architects don't architect, they are architects. Um, they design, and moreover, an architect can't even call him or herself an architect until they go through the very stringent licensing requirements in a set of nine exams. So, um, But I think there's some interesting tension around the word, and since my book looks at how architects use technology to design systems and how that makes for um, the foundation of today's interactive landscape, it seemed appropriate. Okay. And so the book rose out of your uh, PhD work in architecture. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the major architectural and urban consequences that are, are sort of a direct result of emerging technologies? Absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from this history when we look at things like smart cities or the Internet of Things. I think there's a big challenge, big design challenge, in how we scale up from the kinds of models that we make or the kinds of schematics that we make to deploying them at a very large scale. And the Internet of Things is certainly very large scale. Um, smart cities are very large scale, but a lot can go wrong um, unless you're really thoughtful about how we make these kind of scalar shifts. So that's what some of my work looks at. Right. Now there's, a, there's sort of a, a span of, you know, some people take a very dystopian view mm. when they look at um, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence right. or ubiquitous connectivity. Where do you stand on that schema from dystopian to utopian? I stand on the critical side. So that puts me in both camps. Um, I wouldn't say that I am overwhelmingly utopian, although I am very optimistic, but I like to be critical and um, question what's at stake for the technologies we see and how they're being deployed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly a large corporation that might be deploying a big sort of smart cities infrastructure has a lot to gain by certain technologies going forward. Um, so I, I tend to look critically at it, but I don't think it's gonna be the downfall of us all. Um, I'm always fascinated in the history of communication and technology systems, and they're going to continue. So the best thing we can do is be thoughtful and critical about how we use them. Right, and which technology, emerging or otherwise, would you say is affecting design and designers the most today? I think it's around the corner. Um, I'm very curious about how 
how design and design professions are going to be working with AI. Interesting. And I don't know yet all of the ways that it's going to play out. Um, I think that a lot of AI research now tends to happen at a scale where designers aren't entirely sure where to intercede. Mm -hmm. It's more clear in robotics, it's more clear when we're talking about autonomous vehicles or something like that, but how do you get into the design of algorithms? Um, you know, what are you doing in terms of machine learning or natural language processing? Um, but I am very curious about the role design will play. Um, when I look at what the Architecture Machine Group and Nicholas Negroponte were, for instance, doing in the 60s and 70s, working with the AI lab at MIT and their other kinds of tinkering experiments, they were engaging with issues of AI then. And we're in a different paradigm now, but I still have to believe that there's a role for design to play in how we frame those problems and how we experience their results. Sure, sure. And so switching gears just a mm -hmm. little bit, based on your in-depth research into the interactions between mm -hmm. design and all these other industries, what would you say is the most important thing for designers to learn today? You know, some people say designers need to learn to code. Some people say they need an MBA. What, where do you stand on that? I would say that they need to learn a number of tools from sketching to presenting to coding to prototyping. Um, but that the biggest thing they need is their brains. Mm -hmm. I think they need a critical sense and a critical curiosity to not take at face value what they see around them, to find as many ways as they can to turn it upside down and look at a problem and to come up with novel um, novel ways to solve problems. Okay, and so for my last question for you, what people or projects are you following? What are you finding personally interesting these days? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the AI stuff again. Um, I've been curious about conversational interfaces. Um, I'm curious about what has happened as a result of Slack um, that my good friend Stuart Butterfield um, has, of course, started. Um, that it still comes out of a continued engagement with game engines and, and playfulness. That's sort of what underlies it. So I'm curious about what's going to happen there. And then again, I'm always curious about what will happen with smart cities um, and when we will start getting it right, rather than seeing things kind of big and faceless. Right, right. Well, thank you very much for thank talking you. with me today.